Wednesday night we had a healing service and we saw, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 healings, healings, and um, I don't remember everything that happened, but I do remember um, one sister, her leg, uh, in fact, Jeanette, she's here today, she posted on Facebook, her leg grew out, she's been doing chores that don't bother her anymore, her back's better, and then I think, Ralph, you're, you're, you started hearing better too, you didn't, It's it, it didn't stick, okay, it's okay, it's okay, listen, um, you know, when we pray for stuff and maybe it happens right then and you go away it doesn't we're going to talk about that too how to maintain your healing because it's just as important as how as getting a healing is to, is maintaining it um but we had uh, a lot of headaches healed i mean and migraines and i really felt like uh where's, where's my daughter where's victoria she's at work what the heck daughter's pastor's daughter's working on sunday i don't know we're gonna have to talk about this Mm -mm. that's terrible uh but anyway she gave a testimony about being healed of of uh headaches you know victoria in in the past is headaches have cropped up every now and then and you know our family's not a lot different than any other uh we we watch our words we walk in faith but sometimes you know we say well let's get some ibuprofen and let's let's help get through it and um anyway i uh um sorry i, I got distracted uh but I always say, especially if we're on the road, it sometimes it happens when we're on long trips. And uh, I say, well, let's, let's pray before we get some medicine. Let's, I'm not against medicine. Um, I'm for it. Uh, I think some people should be on it. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I say, let's, let's just pray first. And so the reason I'm telling you this is because it's really, uh, Wednesday I talked about the familiar, how familiarity uh, sometimes is hard on healing because uh, people become familiar with people and don't think they can receive from them. But Victoria has always been very, uh, she maintains a lot of honor for Amy and I, even though she's our daughter. And so I'll just lay my hands on her. And usually within uh, less than 10 minutes after we pray for her head, the pain's gone. And so we told that, and there was, I don't know, about 10 people that were dealing with headaches, and, uh, and they received relief. Uh, Victoria prayed over them. And um, I felt like this morning I needed to tell you uh, I felt like there was a question, uh, maybe, because we're talking about healing, that maybe somebody's asked, is, isn't healing passed away? Um, why, why, why do we heal? And that maybe you, you have been taught that healing passed away with the apostles, or it's not really present today. And I just want to tell you real quickly, just, um, I want to I uh, encourage you to keep your your, your heart open as we talk today. Um, the, it's really hard to figure out logic, to figure God out logically. Uh, your, your heart can receive what your mind can't understand because your heart's bigger. The capacity of the spiritual man, of the spirit man is so much bigger than the capacity of the mental man. And so um, I, just, I just felt like, you know, there's so much scripture. But the best one is in, John, in Acts 10.38. Let's just go there real quick. Acts 10.38. And uh, I want to read this to you. This is how I started the first service. Um, and and uh, we had uh, several people last service. We had, ten, or in fact, somebody in uh, Wednesday night got healed from tinnitus. Uh, tinnitus is the ringing in your ear that's constantly there. No matter what you're doing, it's always ringing. And uh, someone was healed from that. And then... Uh, then, of course, we had the back and the, the leg grow out or the leg become even. And um, I had Carl give that testimony because he was sitting there watching it. He was trying to film it with his phone, but he wasn't able to get it. I don't know, I don't know if he's here right now. But anyway, he, wa he watched it. And normally I got really excited when I found out someone's leg was shorter than the other because it's just it's like it's fun to me because God always does. He always heals. And uh, when we were in Romania, it was the first time it happened to me. And, um, and that's just the way the Lord chose to use the, the situation then. But I love it when, when it happens because, I, you know, I'll close my eyes and I just kind of jiggle the feet. I don't know why. It's just what I do. And, uh, and you, you'll learn if you come here longer that uh, when we get into a healing anointing or, or something starts happening, we're having healing service. Sometimes um, things that are undignified happen. 
Um, you know, David, uh, his, the truest expression, of, one of the truest expressions of worship in the Bible was when beca- David became undignified and he stripped himself of his kingly robe and he said the outside doesn't matter near as much as the inside worshiping the Lord. And God was pleased with that. He called David a man after his own heart. But before, David, before God called David a man after his own heart, David was a man after the heart of God. He was after God before God said, you're a man after my heart. And, uh, and our, our example, even with Jesus, was that he did uncommon, strange things to see people healed. Uh, we're going to look at one of, a couple of those things in particular because I'm going to emphasize more on, on the last part of the message today, which is violent healing, um, and, and, and just touch on the first few things. But in Acts 10, 30, uh, starting verse 34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now that's a great scripture altogether on its own because it it says to us that God is not partial to one or the other that I'm sitting down because if I sit down I'll stick with my notes and I want to get through this quickly so that we can do the healing stuff and I know me if I start walking around it's going to get I'll get out everywhere else so um he says he's not not partial but in every every nation whoever hears and you know what's cool about the word is that each Scripture builds on the last. And so first he's saying, God's not partial. The second one, he says, whoever hears. Whoever is an all-inclusive word. You know, we're an inclusive church. We include people quickly. And within inclusivity, we have exclusivity. In other words, um, the more people come to church, the more they fall in relationship, the more they become part of a group. They become part of, you know, even within the church, people say, well, I don't like cliques in church. Well, get over it because there's going to be people that just like each other more than they like others. We, some of us are going to have, you know, you start talking about knives and we're probably going to be close. You know, I, I love knives. I, I was starting to shape one last night, working on my first real one. Um, and, but, but you have commonalities. And, and, you know, here's, this will be a big relief to everybody. You don't have to like everybody. I figured out to get a bigger amen on that. I mean, you, you do have to love everybody. However, you don't have to like everybody. And that brings me a lot of relief as a pastor. So um, it goes on. <laughs> sorry about that. But, uh, I'm not sorry. I take that back. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. In other words, you're accepted by God. The word, of, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace throughout Jesus, throughout, through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed through all Judea and began in Galilee after baptism, which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with... I, 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 I like taking the word the out of front of Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit, this, I think there's only one of two places in the New Testament... Where Holy Spirit, well, usually it's the word pneuma or wind or spirit, but there's two places in the word where it's para, uh, parakletos, which means helper, provider, advocate. It's, a, it's actually an uppercase or a proper name for a person. And Holy Spirit is a person. And uh, he was anointed with Holy Spirit and with power. That's why we preach baptism in the Holy Spirit, because when you become baptized in the Holy Spirit, in Holy Spirit, you also receive power. The power is not to rest in you, it's to do through you. Okay, Uh, and he went about doing good and healing, how many? All All who were oppressed by who? I want to tell you, the oppression comes from the enemy. Disease comes from the enemy, not God. God never, he never broke somebody's leg to slow them down and teach them a lesson. Somebody taught me that when I was in in a, a Bible class in school one day. Um, I went to a Christian school, and he said, you know, I was, I was I got getting prideful. I was a racer. I was really fast, all so on and so forth, going on and on and on about that. And he said, and finally, God broke my leg to teach me a lesson and slow me down and break me of pride. So then you're telling me God's an abusive father. He's a child abuser. No, it's, it's religiously acceptable to say things like that because it makes you... Well, the Lord just had to slow me down. No, you were prideful, you were foolish, and you did something stupid. And you broke your leg, and that's it. Quit trying to make something spiritual out of it. You know, well, God gave me cancer, you know, to teach me humility. And, well, if he did that, then he he needs to be put in jail, and I need to quit serving him. Because 
he's not going to put a death sentence on somebody to try to teach him humility. It's just foolish, and we got to quit. We can't, we can't receive and accept stuff like that. It's just nonsense. And it says, he healed all who were oppressed. He did good everywhere he went, for God was with him. And so why do we heal? Because Jesus healed. Why do we pray for healing? Because Jesus spoke healing. Why do we speak it? Because he spoke it. And he said, before he left, he came back to the disciples after he went to paradise and he had a revival. He came back, led captivity captive. I love the part of that song that says that Jesus put death in its place because he did. Now it's our responsibility to put death in its place because there are those that death still reigns in and we need to speak to the death in them and put it in its place, okay? And so I want to, uh, I, just, I just want to tell you that as we just look at these couple of things today, just let it settle in your heart that healing is for today. It didn't pass away with the apostles. How silly would that have been? Jesus came back, like I was saying a second ago, he came back and he told the apostles, he said, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me, now I give it to you, go and do likewise. What, what is likewise? Well, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he told the disciples to do. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let me get through this, these couple of things real quick. I want to talk to you just real quickly that healing comes through humility. On Wednesday night, we talked about how becoming familiar with people, familiar with God, familiar with church, sometimes robs you of the ability to receive healing because you say, well, I've heard it before, or I've been there before, or, yeah, I heard that. The, the, the greatest trick of the enemy is that the living word of God be preached and go out and, and fall on fertile soil and he comes immediately to steal. In the, the parable of the, seed, of the seed and the sower, it's the same seed that went out on the four different soil types, but only 25% of those soil types received it with gladness. It took root, and they bore fruit. The first one, it fell on just like fall on the concrete, and nothing happened. The enemy came and took it. The second one went into thorny, I think it was rocky soil, and it got a little bit of root, but it didn't do anything. Third one in thorny soil, and the thorns ended up choking it out, which was the cares of life and stuff like that. What I want to tell you is, you know, even in Jesus' ministry, he had 25% retention. He had 12 disciples. He consistently took... Three aside, Peter, James, John, that's 25%. And in the end, there was only one left at the cross. Of the three, there was only one left at the very end. And it was John. And people get, you know, I, I don't like it when people don't get healed or don't receive quickly or people deal with stuff for a long time. It bothers me. But I just remind myself of the fact that Jesus, on his best day, casting the pure word of God out, 25% received it and did something with it. Now, don't get, that doesn't mean that 25% people in here are going to get it. 100% of the people in here can get it. You can be one of the 25%. You get to judge what type of soil you are. But I'll tell you this. As soon as the word is sown, the living word of God comes out and it's sown. Because the word says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. As soon as it comes out and it comes on the soil of your heart, the first thing you need to do is put the, the soil... The, put the soil of experience on top of the seed of the word because it makes it harder for the enemy to find it. Something that's hidden is a lot harder to find than something that's exposed. And so a lot of what Satan's idea, what he wants to do, is he wants you to hear what's being said, but he doesn't want any experience to fall on the seed because then he can come and steal the word. He leaves you with deception, though. He leaves you with mental assent. Mental assent says, oh yeah, I've heard that before, but does nothing with the word. And it actually makes you callous to receiving it in the future. So I just want us to have a, 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 have a, uh, a soft heart. Now James 4.10 says that God resists the proud, but he gives, I think that's Second Peter. James 4 says that, oh, I have it right here. Oh, no, I don't. Um, it says be humble. <laughs> Humility is... Uh, Let's just go there. I end up butchering it. Usually I'm good at remembering stuff, but I'm, I probably need to read this one. James 4 and verse 10. Oh, there it is. Okay. It says this. Um, well, let's start in verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, you, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Now, we don't normally read scriptures like that, and scriptures like that aren't very 
much found in the New Testament, but I want to tell you that when you recognize sin in your life, you recognize trespass in your life, it's good that you be convicted. It's good that you mourn over it, but you don't stay in mourning. Yeah. Mourning and grief, they're, they're seasons, and seasons come to an end. They don't last forever. Um, I hear about people that for 10 years ago, they lost their husband, and they're still dealing with it. I wouldn't, I'm, not pretend, I'm not trying for a moment to minimize their hurt or anything like that, but what I am saying that it, it's for a moment. It doesn't last forever. Uh, ten years goes by, you should be moved on. You should be past that. And uh, again, it's not to minimize that, but if we know that the, the people that passed on are in glory, they're in heaven, man, what, I mean, that's, that's the hope we have, right? That's the comfort we have, that they're hanging out with Jesus, man. They're fishing in great ponds. They're, they're, whatever, they're, whatever they love doing here, they get to do there. It goes on to say, uh, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Uh, but it says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. When we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, see, God's not going to humble us by doing something to us. He gets to work through us when we humble ourselves in his sight. When we do that, he lifts us up because the more humble we become, the more he can use us in the earth. Because the second you start thinking it's you or it's something you've done that you walk in this healing anointing or you have an evangelistic anointing on your life or something like that, you become, you start lifting yourself up. Has anybody ever tried to lift themselves up? I encourage you right now, just stick your hands on yourself and try to lift yourself up. You can't do it. But people try to do it all the time. Try to promote themselves, try to put themselves ahead instead of letting God do it. Well, I'm going to tell you, God's mighty and strong enough to lift you up. Amen. And when he, what he lifts, no man can put down. Amen? Amen? So humble, humbling is, is very, very important. I want to go through a story real quick and then, uh, then move on. The Syrophoenician woman. Uh, she was called the Syrophoenician woman because she was Syrian and Phoenician. These two, both of these were Greek or uh, Gentile nations. They were terrible. They lived terribly. When Jesus said, I don't give what's holy to the dogs, this wasn't the first time she'd ever been called a dog before. She, was, she came to him and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's afflicted with a demon, and I need, her, I need, the, I need my daughter healed. Well, let me, just, let me just say something real quick. Sometimes when you're dealing with something, whether it's a spirit or healing or whatever, ask yourself, is there anything I've done to open a door to let this in? Now, I don't, don't stay in a place of self-examination, but it's a good question to ask because demons don't just possess people. It takes a little doing. I mean, they weren't just walking down the road one day and boom, she had a demon. That doesn't happen like that. But this culture was very demonic. This culture was very anti-God. But this lady had heard Jesus heals. And so she found when he was coming through town and she started screaming, Jesus, son of David. Now, she was using this language, but she shouldn't have been because she was not in covenant. The, the word, the wording is son of David, have mercy. That is a covenant phrase used by the sons of Abraham. And she was outside that covenant asking for those rights and privileges when she hadn't done anything to receive the covenant. But Jesus thought she was, I mean, and she kept after him and the disciples were trying to keep, keep her away and all this kind of stuff. Finally, Jesus turns and says to her, I can't give I've been called to the lost house of Israel, or to the house of Israel. I can't give what's holy to dogs. Now, if I was me, I'd be like, you're some kind of merciful preacher, aren't you? I can't believe you just said that to me. My daughter's home racked with a demon, and you're going to say this to me, and your disciples are trying to, some kind of ministry you are. You know, and most people would lose it right at that point. But this lady does something amazing that we all need to see, that we need to recognize. She said, even the dogs get the crumbs. Whoa! She just said, it only takes an ounce of your anointing. And that demon's gone out of my... I mean, this moment was a moment of humility. What I want to tell you is that when you humble yourself, healing is on its way. Amen? Amen. All right. The other one I wanted to tell you about real quick that I didn't do in the last service was... Um, oh, I must have missed it. Well, we'll just move on. I want to, so the next one's healing through forgiveness. I mean, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I want to tell you, walking in unforgiveness will ruin your life. Walking in unforgiveness will bring pain, anguish, stomach aches, um, digestion issues. 
It will bring worry. It will bring fear. It will bring, it will produce trauma in your life. And some people feel like they, they've justified themselves to walk in unforgiveness because somebody did something really bad to them. I don't ever want to say that, that bad things don't happen. Bad things have happened to all of us. Bad things have happened to all of us. When I was a kid, uh, two different, on two different occasions, two different guys, one was not in church, one was, and they both took advantage of me sexually. Well, I'm not going to hold that against them. It's just the way it, it's just, it happened. And I could get into this, uh, to this place of, well, why did that happen to me? My, mom, my dad was in ministry. My mom was in ministry. Why did that happen to me? Why? 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 Let me tell you something. The chasm of why will keep you separate from God. You can't continue to ask. I mean, I, I'm not saying don't ever ask God why, but I want to tell you, you can get lost in the why. Yeah. And I want to tell you this. Sometimes you couldn't handle the answer if it came. As smart as you think you are, as big as you think you are to receive, sometimes the why is too great. A lot of people do this with people that passed away or, you know, I mean, I, we could ask this question, you know, with things that we've dealt with in our family. Why us? We've got teaching going on in our house. We've got, you know, children in church and all. Why? 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 Every time you ask why, it leads you further away from God and further toward being angry. People get so ticked off because they don't know why. Because there's this insatiable appetite in them to understand every aspect. Yeah. Your pea brain can't understand every aspect. Yeah. I don't mean that mean or anything, but my pea brain can't. The truth is we live in a fallen world and things happen. It's how you're prepared to deal with it that matters. We're more than overcomers. That means we have to be comer-overs. We have to come over something to be an overcomer. Yeah. Right? You don't just get the label without doing it. You don't get the stamp of approval without having come over something. Yeah. Right? Okay. So, don't get caught in the why. Don't get caught in having a logic and understanding deficit and holding that up as a label. So many people own their diseases. They own their stuff. Somebody was talking to me between service. I don't ever, uh, I, well, this is a good, good moment. Um, about four or five years ago, I, was at a, I did a couple of services up in Chicago. Found out a young man there had AIDS. And I don't know what it is. It's never bothered me to touch things or be around things. Even when we go to uh, Romania or what, Guatemala, whatever, I, I, you know, if somebody brings me, brings me tea or brings me something and I have no idea where it came from, and, and something to eat. I eat it. When I was in Africa, I ate something I didn't know what it was. Now, and I'm not telling everybody to do that. I just think, hey, I'm going to do it. Um, it's going to be like every other food that I eat. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. Um, but I, I found this out this kid had AIDS, and I went to him, and I hugged him. Now, some people think, well, you better be careful. You know, AIDS, AIDS. You give more respect to the disease than you do to the healer. Well, you could get it. If it scares you, don't do it. But it didn't scare me because I knew the healer in me was bigger than the disease outside of me. And that disease, he was born again, so that disease no longer belongs to him. And we gave it an eviction notice. We said, you're not, you're not belong here. This is a child of God. So I hugged him and I embraced him. Put my hand on his head. I ministered to him. And uh, I just texted the pastor this morning, and he said that... Um, that young man is, is still living for God. He is working in construction. He's a man's man. He's left the homosexual lifestyle, and he's gained weight since we see. Now, when you have AIDS, you normally don't gain weight. You lose weight. You whittle away. Uh, and he's not been back to the doctor. He just continues to thank God for his healing. I don't tell everybody not to do that, but some people don't need to go back and get a negative word. Now, if God says don't go back to the doctor, don't go back to the doctor. If he says go back to the doctor, then go back to the doctor. You just have to be led, okay? Yeah. Just don't, I'm just, I, so many people, Christians do this, they just get caught in the, I don't understand. Why me? I mean, I'm, I'm, we're on, we're streaming right now. There's somebody out there that's, why me? Why me? Well, I can't tell you that. And you don't need the answer. You need to let all the preparation that's gone into your life to this point bring you out. 
because so, it, it, what it does is the why, it just, it's like it, it digs this huge chasm between you and the healer. Yeah. And you'll end up resenting God. You'll end up getting angry with God. Why? You, 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 I see you heal this one, but you won't heal me. You can't, well, you can't do that. Yeah. We can't let a sense of entitlement come. Well, I've been saved 10 years. I've been praying for this 10 years, and somebody next to me has been saved for a minute, and they got the healing I've been believing for. I deserve that. You may have some pride to deal with. Remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Healing is within grace. Grace is within humility. Okay. Um, so we need to walk in forgiveness. So there's so many benefits. Even science sees so many benefits to walking in, to, to walking in forgiveness. Um, when, you, when you forgive someone, you can't use the past trespass to bolster a current offense. In other words, if you forgive someone... Take it out of the file and shred the file. Don't put it back in the file so that you can use it later and say, see, I told you. In Psalm 103, it says that the Lord, he chooses, the the Lord can't forget. Well, I'm sorry. Forget, the definition of forget is to choose not to remember. So in the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is from, from the west... It says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as how he is, is, as far as he's removed your sins from you. The Lord can't forget. He's omniscient. He knows everything. But he chooses not to recall. He chooses not to recall your trespass. He chooses not to recall your foul up. And I thank God for that, man. Yeah, I mean, I'd be in trouble every day. But he chooses not to remember. We have to do the same thing. And when we forgive somebody, we need to choose not to remember that. Because when we choose to remember that, we hold them in that offense. And you, you may think, well, I mean, they really did something bad to me. They may have. But you're holding them in that place of offense. And you're holding yourself in a place to receive from the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody wants to receive from the enemy. Because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It's his job description. It's not ever going to change. Remember? In, in uh, Acts 10.38, it says... He's the one that's brought the affliction. All right. Um, In this, forgive yourself. I've had people tell me, well, I can forgive others, but I can't forgive myself. It's impossible. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you haven't received. And to say I can't be forgiven or I'm not going to forgive myself is to say the blood of Jesus wasn't worth it. It wasn't big enough to forgive me. Let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus is big enough to forgive everybody. And I know that if he forgave me of what I've done, then it is my right and duty to forgive others for what they've done to me. Yeah. Release the grip of the grudge. Yeah. grudge. Grudges have this grip, and they hold tight on your heart. They're like claws that dig deep in, but forgiveness, they have to release it. And praise. Praise in advance for the victory. Satan hates praise. He, he, he hates it. I mean, it's like uh, an ice pick in the ear. He hates it. And so when you start praising God, when you start forgiving people, one, you're going to get healthier. Your immune system comes back up. Did you know that your immune system is attacked when you walk in unforgiveness and bitterness? Your stomach. There's a, there's, I don't want to get into it too much. Inside you, there's a, um, it's called a ganglion mass. And it's akin to the, to the brain. As a as a, um, a center of thought, center of emotion, but it's you, you, scientists can't even they can't unravel it. But it's within this place that feelings and that energy and that healing comes from. That's why the word says, "Out of your belly will flow issues of living water." Yeah. It's that belly. It's that mass. You understand how amazing we are. I mean, you know, they're, they're out of their mind. But the mind, the brain is an organ. Yeah. The mind, spirit, and soul. That's why spiritual things override physical things. Because we truly are spiritual beings. Now, we're supposed to live in harmony and integrity. Body, soul, and spirit. But anyway, I can't, I, I gotta get back to this other stuff. Okay. 
uh, why is forgiveness so hard? Because the idea of giving something free of charge is a foreign concept to us because the world we live in has trained us to live in an equal trade reality. You give me, I'll give you. You behave right, I'll forgive you. I'll know that you really, I'll know that uh, you'll know I'll really forgive you when your, your behavior changes. It's a good thing God didn't say, you, you behave right, then I'll forgive you. Yeah. None of us ever be forgiven. Yeah. Half of us don't behave right still. <laughs> don't grade sin and trespass in others, and they won't grade it in you. Who will say, well, homosexuality is worse than, it's one of those. And I hear, the, I hear preachers, it's, it's the unpardonable sin. It's the, you know, homosexuality is an abomination before God. Yeah, so is gossiping. In fact, gossiping is listed with murder. So what are you doing? You know, if you're not bringing healing, you're bringing hurting. Anyway, unforgiveness is not just about the bondage you're held in, but the revelation you're held from. Unforgiveness is not about what you're held in, the bondage you're held in. It's about the revelation you're held from. Because God wants to use revelation in your life to bring you to a place to help somebody else. Everybody's been through crap. Everybody's been through stuff. And what God does is turns the bad into good. And Satan hates it when you get healed. Because when you give it to somebody else, it spreads. It's like a great infection. It spreads quick. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, listen to this. Fear wants, physical act. Fear wants physical action that matches the emotional trespass. It believes unless action is taken, there will be a loss of dignity. In other words, they got to pay for what they did, or I'll never regain my dignity. No, you regain your dignity through his blood and forgive them for what they did. Yeah. Last thing I want to talk to you about real quick, and I, I'm going to quit sitting down because I can't stand it. Um, Violent healing. John said this. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the, violence ta- and the violent take it by force. Now, most of the time, Christians aren't, and we're not associated with violence, physical violence, and we shouldn't be. But I want to tell you something. If you could see in the spiritual realm, if you could see beyond yourself, oh, something, I thought that was something jumped out at me. <laughs> Sin in the spirit realm. <laughs> But if you could see, you would see a war. You would see angels with swords. You would see the warring angels every time we speak a word of victory. Every time we have a song of praise, you would see them battling back the enemy in the darkness so that we can advance one more step. The violent take it by force. You see, we don't wrestle with, with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, rulers and darkness, all that kind of stuff. Our, our humility... Puts us in a place to receive grace. Our grace is the power to do and move forward. The violent take it by force. And so I, I, this message, I don't, this was three messages that I had and I reduced it to this. It was called violent healing. Jesus, let me tell you, let's tell you this story and then you can go look it up. Jesus cured blindness through spitting on a man. Now, let me look at my notes because this is interesting. You know that um, John said the king of, I think it was John that said, the king of heaven suffers violence, the violent take it by force. Maybe it was Jesus, I don't know. But John was violent. He was you know, he was expect, they expected him to be, you know, soft and, and loving and all this kind of stuff, but he was pretty outspoken. He was pretty crazy. He was actually um, described as fervid or extremely hot. Hang on a second. I got, I got, oh, well. Well, I was talking to you about the spitting, right? Okay. Help me, Jesus. Okay, I can't find it. The point is that Jesus did things that the Pharisees and Sadducees saw as improper. He did things that they saw they saw him as as a violent man or a. Um, 
improper, undignified. In the, in the word, spitting, I think it, uh, I really wish I had my thing. I, but I think the word, the, the word to spit is mentioned nine times. In the New Testament, it, it's mentioned, no, in the, it's mentioned nine times total. Five times, it, it has a, a negative connotation of filth. Uh, three times, it's about Jesus being spit upon. And one time, it's about Jesus spitting on somebody. But I want you to see this. Jesus wasn't spitting on the blind man. He was spitting on the blindness. He was saying, you're not worthy. I spit on you. It, that's really cool to me because Jesus wasn't shaming a person. He was shaming the thing on the person yeah, right. yeah. and saying, you don't belong here. Now, in, um, in, in Mark 1 and verse and 39, this is really great. And, I gotta, um, and then I'm going to clo- finish this. And I've got a, several things to, to, to mention that the Lord gave me in between services. So go to Mark 1. Everybody okay? If you, if you need to stand up and stretch your legs, you're welcome to. In fact, everybody just stand up real quick. Because most likely what's going to happen is somebody will take me up on this when I really get in a flow. So and this gives a chance for people to just stretch your back out a little bit. We're not going to be here much longer, but um, you can go ahead and sit down. Wednesday night when we had a healing service, you can go ahead and sit down. When we had a healing service, we went long. And uh, you know, and what's long? Really? What is that? It's kind of like somebody says, well, you're not normal. Well, what's normal? Normal is a setting on a dryer. You know, it's not, it's not anything that, anyway. Um, but people, not, nobody left Wednesday night. Now, I'm not saying if you, don't have, if you have some place to be that you, don't, that you can't leave or something like that. But there is a place that the Lord will take us, a new level of healing, a new level of grace for those who are hungry to receive it that are in partnership to receive more from God, right? Okay, and where did I tell you to go? Mark 1 and uh, 39, thank you. Uh, I messed this up. Dad, oh no, there it is. No, it's verse 40, 39. Um and he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. I like that part. <laughs> now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion. See, I like the New King James. In the, in the King James, it says, moved with pity and sympathy. Jesus, now listen, King James is not the end all be all to Scripture. Let me just tell you. He said, well, if it ain't King James, it's not Bible. King James not even Bible, man. <laughs> King James stood over the scribes that were writing it and told them, do this, don't do this. There are foul, and that's one of them. Jesus never moved in pity. He never moved in sympathy. He moved in compassion. Pity if he gets down and sits with somebody. Compassion comes down with a strong arm and lifts him up. Jesus healed all that were oppressed of the enemy. He was moved with compassion for everybody that was oppressed. And this guy comes up to him, and I'm going to tell you something. I need James, come up here and stand right here. This guy comes up to Jesus and, uh, have mercy on me. If you will, you can heal me. Why is it that people knowing Jesus healed came up and asked the question, if you will, you can? Because we all feel like at some point in time, he can with others, but not with me. Yeah. Or he won't with me because I'm not right. Jesus broke that mold with a Syrophoenician woman. Jesus broke that mold with, uh, the, uh, uh, even in the Old Testament, with Naaman the Syrian. Yeah. He was healed of leprosy by Elijah. Yeah. But he comes up, he gets on his knees before Jesus and says, have mercy on me. If you will, you can heal me. Now, in the, as it reads in the Bible, in the King James, it's so weak. I don't like it. We're going to set it straight today. It says, um, and being moved with, this is actually the Amplified, I think. Being moved with pity and sympathy, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be made clean. 
and at once the leprosy completely left him, and he was made clean by being healed. Now, there's two different things happen when you get healed of leprosy. One, the leprosy stops. The disease is driven out, but you're still left with a lot of scars. Yeah. Leprosy, your ears fall off, your eyes sink in, your nose falls off, fingers, digits fall off, skin peels off of you, pus oozes from you. Sounds pretty nasty. I mean, and the way that the King James says it, you know, people interpret Jesus differently than how he really was. It's just like, well, um, I, yeah, I'm willing. Um, let me find a clean place to put my finger. Be healed. Now, if Jesus wanted to do that, he could. However, if you study the Greek out, what it means is Jesus fastened himself. He fastened himself on the guy with leprosy. He embraced him. And what he said was this. In that moment, he just broke the Old Testament uh, principle that anything that unclean touches you, you become unclean. Jesus said, no, I'm clean. And anything that unclean that touches me becomes clean. Jesus fastened himself to him, and so the leprosy stopped, and you could just, I mean, just imagine the skin was just restored, and he had ba- like skin like a baby, an ear popped back on his, fa- on his head, you know, a nose came back, and, and, and he's not like anybody ever remembered him. Because yeah. Jesus never just heals part of you, he heals all of you. Amen. He heals you body, soul, and spirit. Yeah. Yeah, Praise God. Jesus fastened himself. That's why when the kid had AIDS, I just just grabbed him. And hold, you know, John G. Lake, and I've told this story I don't know how many times, but John G. Lake had him put bubonic plague in his hand. He was over in Africa when the bubonic plague was, it was killing everybody. I mean, it was wiping Africa out. And he was seeing people healed. And he went in and uh, he went down to a dead body and uh, took a swab out of their mouth of the saliva and put it on his hand. And the scientist said, you've just signed your own death warrant. You're going to die. You've got it. This stuff is so contagious. And he says, no, you don't understand. The lightnings of God exist in me. And so anything deadly touches me begins to die. Put his hand on the microscope, and the bubonic plague was dying. Each set cells were dying. Because anything that comes in contact with the living God has to come in composition. It has to align itself with the living God. And death can't, death can't. Uh, death can't rain. Amen? Amen.